Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Welcome to Calvary. If you're new here, thank you for bringing family or friends, church, if you brought them for this brand new series where we begin in the book of Acts. And this is an introduction today. And I want to share with you my heart for this series is that we see Jesus and the church and the way God meant for us Christians to live in a fresh way and that God would fix and work on us to be what he intended for us to be. This book is extremely fascinating and intriguing uh, because there's so many really, like just really good topics uh, about Christianity and Jesus and the church. Topics like miracles, demon possession and deliverance from demons, water baptism, speaking in tongues and praying in tongues, shipwrecks, drama like that. People wanting to kill Christians, persecution, the message of salvation, healings, profound sermons that have changed people's lives forever, and a very dominant theme of the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit in action. Acts is a very important link between the New Testament gospel books, the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the rest of the Bible. We need Acts to help us understand what did the church do without Jesus around? How did the church function? Who is the Holy Spirit working through the church? We wouldn't know how the Holy Spirit operates and empowers believers for ministry and witness without the book of Acts. We wouldn't have vivid examples of how spirit-filled and spirit-led followers of Christ spread the good news, how they heal or preach and even how they face persecution, so we know how to face persecution. Acts has provided context to the missionary journeys that have given us uh, books like Philippians, Thessalonians, Colossians, and the letters to Timothy. If we didn't have the book of Acts, we wouldn't have an idea of where Paul went and why those books were written in the first place. As I said before, the book of Acts is key when it comes to the theme of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? And Acts and Luke are written by the same person, which is Luke, which I'll get into here in a moment. But it's the only book that focuses the most time on the Holy Spirit is these two books. Uh, Acts reveals a crucial blending of God's people and the Holy Spirit working together. The Spirit is mentioned around 51 times in the book of Acts, and it's been nicknamed the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Some also have nicknamed it the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles or through the church. Now, some people are a little critical of some of the things that take place in the book. Some people view this book and the principles therein as only needed at the beginning of the church, claiming it no longer is relevant for today. I would disagree. On the contrary, the content reveals that God wanted it to be a guide for Christian living and for spirit-filled churches. Nothing in Acts or the rest of the New Testament teaches that the miracles, spiritual gifts, and standards for the church revealed were only relevant for a period of time. The powerful works of the Holy Spirit were not meant to end with the ministry of Christ's followers. Christians today have the same promise of the Holy Spirit, the same call to be witnesses, the same spiritual gifts distributed to the church by the Holy Spirit, and the same commission from Jesus, go and make disciples. Why would any of that stop? It continues. We need to be witnesses. We need to go make disciples. We need miracles, signs, and wonders. We need the gifts of the Spirit working in the church so if you've had questions about that, you've come to the right series. To complement this point that it continues, the book of Acts doesn't have a formal ending. It ends abruptly. Go to the very last chapter of Acts and you will see that Luke just stops. We don't know why. Some believe that he was persecuted and killed, um, possibly by Nero and, um, and Rome, or that something else happened 
and he had to run and he no longer recorded anything else because he separated from everything that was going on because of the persecution. We're not sure. All we know is it just ends. But perhaps there's a reason why. Perhaps the work continues in us. Perhaps we will be the generation that brings a conclusion to the book of Acts because we continue to be the church set on fire by Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and we bring the gospel to the world. Amen. See, God sent Jesus to earth to save. Jesus sent the apostles out to preach this salvation message and now the Holy Spirit sends us out today to do the exact same thing. The story isn't over in Acts because God's not done saving. He's not done working. He wishes that none shall perish but have everlasting life. Church, we have a great opportunity with the power and the presence and the help of the Holy Spirit to get this good news out. Amen. Amen. I need you to be patient with me today because I need you... I need to set, sorry, for us, for you, a table before we feast on the depths of this scripture. I need to set a framework, so to say, to help us really understand what this book is about. I think it's important we understand who Luke is and the setting and why it was written, the time it was written, so that we can understand what's going on in the rest of the book. So permission to get a little geeky on some information today. Is that a word? I don't know. I, who knows? Yeah, we'll just go with it, okay? Just to help us understand, and today our scripture is very short, but other weeks we're going to go into uh, longer portions of scripture because you need to in, under, in, our, uh, in order to understand fully the context and the meaning of the scripture. Some days will be shorter, some days will be longer. Um, just patience with me, and you know what? Who's in a rush? If Jesus comes back, at least we'll be in the series of the book of Acts, all right? <laughs> I just, I've also just want to let you know this too. I, I've just been, God's been also teaching me to be patient with sermons, to not rush everything, to let, let the word of God marinate in our church, to soak up the word of God and to really understand what it means so we can better under, uh, believe and help other people understand. I've also been praying this. I want to be upfront with you. I've been praying that God would stir a hunger for knowledge and understanding and application in your heart. That you would come hungry for the word, come hungry to worship, and that you would also have an open heart to learn these sometimes complicated topics and difficult things in scripture, but also go live them out too. Church, it's, it's, it's important that we're not a monument, but we're a movement. Monuments are awesome. They tell of history, but movements keep making history. And we're meant to be a movement for the Lord, Jesus Christ. Let's go to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to also look at Luke chapter 1 to help us understand this book, who is the author, what's the purpose, the occasion for the writing. Acts chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, and I use the New Living Translation, um, it's a good translation for new believers or people who are newer to the faith. But I also enjoy it as a seasoned follower of Christ as well. Um, and we're going to be in Luke 1 too uh, as well. And I'm going to start with Acts 1 though because this is the book that we're studying. Acts 1 verse 1. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. So real quick, this is Luke writing to his friend named Theophilus. And he says, uh, I remember that first book, I told you about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, referring to the ascension, which happened after the resurrection, after giving his apostles further instructions through the help of the Holy Spirit, the guiding, the leading of the Holy Spirit. Just so you know, Jesus was also filled with the Holy Spirit. 
a model for us to be filled with the Spirit. And verse 3, during the 40 days after he suffered and died, referring to his resurrection, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. So that is now, or in this book, but let's look at Luke chapter 1, previous, Luke was writing for Theophilus as well. Luke 1 verse 1, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Isn't that good? So you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. We see here that Luke is concerned for Theophilus' faith and that he understands it is true and to be certain in it. Who is the author? Well, we know it's Luke. And Bible historians predominantly date his writing around A.D. 60 through 63. Now, if you go to Wikipedia, it's going to say later on, and that's not Christian biblical historians, that's secular historians saying that. Predominantly, the church says that this was written around A.D. 63. Why is that important? Well, because Nero came in and was destroying the temple in A.D. 64 through a time period, and Luke never records that in the book of Acts. He never records the, the wars against Rome, the Jewish wars against Rome. And uh, he also um, never records the fall of Jerusalem either. And that all happened from 64 AD on. So we believe that he wrote it around this time. Now, Jesus died and rose again AD 33. So if it was uh, AD 63 that Luke wrote this, that would be only 30 years after Jesus rose again. Why is that important? Because anything written 100 years later usually is not verified as a trustworthy text to learn from historically because probably legend has been included in the letter. False stories. So this was written only 30 years after Jesus rose again, which makes it very, a very strong book and, and ver verification, validation that Jesus rose again. So apologists and historians use the book of Acts as proof that Jesus really did uh, come alive and was risen again by the Lord, and he lived. This is, that's a critical point for this uh, series. Luke is a native of Antioch, which makes him a Gentile. Gentiles are anyone who's not a Jew at this time. Luke was a physician. He was a doctor, a disciple of the first apostles, and a traveling co-worker with the apostle Paul. And how, how good is that? Because if you, if you know, uh, Paul was whipped and beaten many times. How cool is that to have a doctor with you on the, you know? I'm sure he has a lot of things he needs help with. And so the doctor was with him. That was nice to have. Luke is considered a, the most polished and expert in Greek language because the majority of the New Testament was written in the Greek. And because he's a Gentile, he'd be very familiar with the Greek language and he is uh, considered the most polished in the Greek language. He's also called a historian. Let me just share a few facts on this. Uh, Acts covers selected portions of the first 30 years of the history of the church in the book of Acts. Uh, Luke traces the spread of the message about Christ all the way from Jerusalem to Rome. In the process, Luke mentions 32 countries, 54 cities, nine Mediterranean islands, 95 different persons by name, and a variety of government officials by their specific titles. Modern archaeology continues to confirm the amazing accuracy of the details recorded by Luke. And in fact, archaeologists use the book of Acts to help them find things in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. That's how solid he was as a historian. The first book is the Gospel of Luke. And in that book, Luke took time to record the life of Jesus from his birth to his death to his resurrection. And he wrote this accurate account for Theophilus so he would know he could truly believe in what he was taught. Now, just so you know, Luke 
was not an eyewitness like John was or Matthew or other disciples. Luke was a convert of those disciples. So he received those events from the eyewitnesses themselves. But later on in the book of Acts, Luke actually becomes part of the journey. While in the first portion of Acts, he was also learning these things from eyewitnesses, we learn of we passages later on in the book of Acts where it looks like uh, Luke joined Paul on missionary journeys. So halfway through the book, a little further in, the more the latter part of the book of Acts, we're going to see where Luke includes himself on missionary journeys because he was with Paul. So he got saved and then joined Paul in the mission. How cool is that? They believe, too, that he learned a lot of everything that happened when he was uh, with Paul. Paul was on house arrest where he wrote Timothy and other books, and he was in prison, basically, in chains, but they had him under house arrest, and they believe Luke was with him during that time, learning everything that happened from Paul and the other apostles. That's pretty neat as well. Who is Theophilus? We have no information about him. His name means one who loves God. He's the recipient of the, the letter of, of Luke, the book of Luke. Um, he's also the recipient of Acts, but we don't have anything other than the fact that his name means one who loves God, friend of God, or dear to God. The title, most excellent, that's what Luke calls him, implies he is a man of rank, but it may just be a greeting of respect. We don't know if he's a believer. It looks like he is, or he's at least been taught these things from Luke, and Luke's just trying to help him make sure he uh, is confirmed in the faith that he really does believe in the truth that he was taught. His purpose is larger uh, than just Theophilus. His scope was more than just one man. Uh, Luke is the only Gentile author of the New Testament. Everyone else came from Hebrew background, Jewish background. So we believe the Holy Spirit used Luke to identify with Gentiles and help them understand that the gospel was for them too, not just the Jews. That's a very unique uh, trait about this book and about Luke. And his purpose is pastoral as well as evangelistic. He really cared about the Christians understanding salvation and water baptism and being filled with the Spirit, but he also wrote these books so that people who were not saved would believe. Hence the reason why today we probably have a mixed group in here if we invited people to come with us who may be seekers or unbelievers, you know, looking for the truth, and then we have people who have been saved for many years, amen? And in fact, let's, let's make sure we mix together. And learn together. Amen? And let's make sure we invite people. Let's send these sermons to our friends. Because Luke wrote the book of Acts to help people believe, but also to help the church remain strong in the Lord. Amen? Now, the setting of chapter 1 is after the resurrection of Jesus, which we already read in verses 2 and 3. So, the setting is actually the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ, that he is alive and that you can be saved and have eternal life. So the church is alive at this moment, okay? Basically, what happens here is, is Luke writes uh, the gospel of Luke and where he leaves off, he continues with the book of Acts to help Theophilus and everyone else who would read it. But what's happening is at the end of Luke, Jesus comes alive, God raises Jesus from the dead. He begins to appear to his disciples and followers to show them he's alive. And Luke doesn't hold back, and he even shows how the disciples didn't believe it at first. He even shows that the disciples were doubtful that he was alive. He shows their doubt just to show their humanity and that even people who are believers at one time could struggle to believe. But nevertheless, after Jesus showed himself uh, as being alive to his followers, the church explodes. Something comes alive in them. And it's because Jesus is alive. And that's what we're going to learn as we go through the book of Acts. It's the beginning of the church, alive in Christ, set on fire by the Holy Spirit. Now, before Jesus goes, um, or after, I'm sorry, after he resurrects, the Bible calls the next part ascension which means Jesus rose off the ground and ascended into heaven 
to be with his father. And that's what our scripture today says as well. I'm going to read it again in Acts. Um, Until the day he was taken up to heaven, there it is, that's the ascension, after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. And during those 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive and he taught to them about the kingdom of God. All right, let me go to Luke chapter 24. If you have your Bibles, please go to it. It won't be on the screen, unfortunately, for you today. But Luke chapter 24, and we're going to be in verse 44. I want to give us a little piece of what he's saying here to give us context. Jesus shows up to them in Luke 24, and we we read a story about it. I'm going to start with verse 44. I want you to see how Luke was connecting the dots and helping Theophilus get a whole picture of what was going on. But also for us, these events really happened, and it changed the church forever. And by the way, church, if Jesus is alive, shouldn't we be alive in him? Shouldn't we be on fire and active and excited and joyful and praising him? So verse 44, then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Ooh. Now, earlier I said, I'm praying that God opens up your hearts and stirs your hearts to receive, to have a hunger for knowledge. See, the Lord has to open your heart to understand the scriptures. So before I read the Bible, I always ask God to help me do that, to help me understand the scriptures. Because even right here, Jesus says he did that for them. Verse 46, and he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die, which is the cross, and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message will be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. So was the resurrection the end of the gospel work? No. This this event, everything that happened with Jesus' life was meant to be preached to the nations, not to stop here in this moment. What is the message? There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent, for all who turn around, who turn away from their sin and turn towards Jesus and believe in him as our Lord and Savior, you will have salvation. You will have eternal life. And then verse 49 says, and now I will send the Holy Spirit. Wait a minute, let me stop for a moment because I just got a little check in my spirit about this. Isn't that good news? Like, I, want, I think God wants me to stop for a second. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. That's good news. Wow. Now look, people, people don't want to talk about sin and people don't want to stop sinning, so I get why this can be hard. <laughs> right? But the good news is Jesus changes your life if you do. Why is it then that we as Christians are not telling people about this more? Why is it not more of our Facebook posts and social media posts, text messages and emails and all those things? Why is this not us? Why aren't we being witnesses? This is good news. Praise the Lord. Now, forgive me if I'm wrong. If you've been busy, praise the Lord. But statistics are showing that Christians are not actively sharing this good news. We're barely reading our Bibles according to statistics. Less than 5% of Christians are reading their Bible on a regular basis. So it makes it hard for me to think that we have the courage to tell sinners that they can repent and be saved if we're not even reading our Bibles in private. So I, forgive me if I'm wrong, and I, I'm only saying this out of love, but all I'm saying is we're supposed to be alive because Jesus is alive, and he commissioned the, the, the first church here, the first generation of church members to go out and tell everyone this good news. And so are you. You are called to do this, and so am I. I'm preaching to myself today. And then, to help you, he gives us the Holy Spirit. Verse 49, and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. Do you know what the Holy Spirit is? I'm getting into next week, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's the presence of Jesus with you. 
okay? I'm sending the helper with you. Now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven or clothing, clothe you with power from heaven. And then the ascension happens. Then Jesus led them to Bethany and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. So they worshiped him and then returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy. There it is. There's the joy. And they spent all of their time in the temple praising God or in the upper room praying together as we'll learn in Acts 1. How cool is that? Why is that an important moment in Christian history? Because Jesus says, I will come back the same way. The, the angel said he will come back the same way. Okay, so false messiahs will come from the, the ground. Jesus comes from the sky. And that's how we know he is the true savior and the one to take his church to be with him at the second coming. So praise God for that. This is the good news. This is the setting that launches uh, Luke into this amazing book. But I'm going to tell you, just, it's not just about the gospel. It's about so many other things. But the gospel is the launching pad for Luke, which it should be. And he gets a lot into the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, which we call that in theology class, pneumatology. So the study of the spirit. Pneuma being spirit, ontology being study. So Luke is a big teacher on the Holy Spirit, which makes sense. He got saved most likely after the Holy Spirit came upon the church in Acts 2. So he learned a lot about the Holy Spirit, and he wrote that in Luke and in Acts. What is the good news, the gospel? Let me make sure I clarify that today, moving forward into this as we close. Jesus, and I want you to hold on to this because I'm going to invite people to believe in the gospel today. Jesus, the Son of God, was born into this world through the Virgin Mary and lived a perfect, sinless life. He died on the cross for our sins, so the punishment for our sins would be on him instead of us. Three days later, God raised Jesus from the dead, proving his divinity and victory over sin and death. This is what we call salvation. And this salvation from sin and death is offered to all people. Say all people with me. Christians are believers saved by this gift of salvation and sent by God to deliver this good news and invitation. God is inviting you through believers, or if you read the Bible on your own, he's going to invite you to believe in this truth, repent and turn away from your sinful life, and the gospel invites us to follow Jesus into a new life now and we, we are also considered to have already received eternal life, even though we must wait for that. So you inherit a new life in Christ and you inherit eternal life if we pass away or Jesus comes back first. This is the good news. This is the gospel. And we must include the resurrection because Jesus had to, de to defeat sin and death so that it could be good news. Otherwise, it's just bad news. Because if Jesus stayed dead, then he didn't work. And he wasn't telling the truth. But he is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. Thank the Lord. So how can we apply this to our lives today? Number one, let me talk to the church. Here's some takeaways. Reach one. Reach one person this school year. If you're not on a mission yet to be a witness and to reach anyone, I want to encourage you to just consider reaching one person. Where am I getting this from? Okay, you ready? Luke did all this work for one guy. Now, do we know that God used it for many more? Absolutely. But he took the time First of all, Luke got saved, right? And it changed his life. And then he did research and he asked good questions. And he took, took the time to write down two whole books for one guy named Theophilus, nicknamed Theo, I guess. Who knows? His buddy Theo. 
He did all this because one person matters in the story of God. You matter to God, and that's why you're here saved and changed, hopefully, right? You matter. God sees all people, but in the middle of seeing all people, he also still sees you and says, I love you. And Luke was changed, and he said, I want to help other people come to Christ. And he found Theophilus, and he took the time to make sure he truly understood and truly believed. In other words, he discipled his friend Theophilus. So let me get to my second point. Reach from experience. Reach from your own testimony. You have been saved by grace through faith. You have been changed. You have a testimony. You have been growing and reading the word. You've been going to at least sermons, right? You've been coming to church and you're reading the Bible. You're reading your devotional plans. The Lord has put a lot of his word in you, but you also have the Holy Spirit at salvation to help you. And we're going to learn about even more power next week for witnessing. But he has given you the help of the Holy Spirit. Reach from experience. Be discipled this year. Come to this series on a regular basis. Grow in your word and your knowledge of the word. Read the Bible and you will have plenty to help the Theophiluses in your life. <laughs> plenty. And lastly, the gospel is the starting point. We start with the good news of Jesus. Because the good news changed us, and from there we just progressed. Start with the gospel. The gospel is the starting point for every person who becomes a Christian. You can't be saved and be a Christian without Jesus. You have to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God who came to earth from God, died on the cross for our sin and your sin, but then rose again to say, you have power over sin and death and you have eternal life. This is the good news. And he offers it freely. You can't earn it. You can't pay for it. You can't have, uh, you, have to, you don't have to have a certain amount of knowledge to get it. You don't have to be a certain social class to have it. It's for all people of all ages. If we can believe in Jesus Christ, we can be saved. If we can trust in him, maybe you're the one today. Maybe you're the one that Calvary's been looking for to help. Calvary is looking for the lost so we can help them be saved. We are searching. And if you need help today, we have plenty of seasoned believers in this room. Raise your hand if you've been saved for a long time. Maybe over two years. Praise the Lord. We have plenty of people here ready to help. And maybe I need to do a commissioning service right now. <laughs> okay. There's great responsibility with that, though, isn't there? Because it says Luke carefully documented these things. We must be careful that as we reach from experience, we do have the right knowledge of the Word of God. And we know we're going in the right direction. And the starting point is not just our group here at church to help people get plugged in. <laughs> Plug. The starting point is really the gospel. Let me tell you why. Why don't we stand together? I want to tell you a story. And today, I'm, I'm, I believe the Holy Spirit already began to work you in the worship set to believe in him as your Lord and Savior. If you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, <clears throat> would you, do you mind letting us pray for you even down here? I know that's so, might be weird for you. Um, we're not trying to single you out, even though it may feel like that. We literally just want to pray for people. And it may be that you need prayer for more than just salvation. If you need prayer for anything, come on down. We're going to have team members come around you to pray for you. Even while I'm telling this story, it's, it's quite all right, because it matters more that this happens, Okay. I'm on Facebook this past weekend in a messenger, uh, Facebook messenger, and a gentleman reaches out and he has questions about another religion. And so we began to process it and talk about it. And I told him what we believe as Christians, the same thing I've already told you, that Jesus is the, is the divine son of God, that we must believe in him for salvation 
and we will be saved. And so I began to process this with him, and I sent him that. I, I asked him three questions. Do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? Do you believe that he died for your sins, and will you follow him? And instead, he changed the subject. And I called it, the Holy Spirit called it, actually. And so I returned back to that conversation, and I said, I hear what you're saying, but hey, I noticed you ignored my questions. Is, there, is everything okay? Do you, do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? Do you believe he died for your sins? Will you believe in him to be your salvation? I asked him those questions again, and this was his response, and I get it all the time. And I'm not, we're not judging him. We need to actually empathize with him and have compassion. He said, I've been hurt so much by the church or Christians, I can't answer that question, those questions right now. Well, look, I, I, I wrote back, I actually know where you're coming from. I have too. I've been hurt by Christians too. But guess what? Christians don't help us get to heaven. I mean, they help us get to heaven, but Christians don't save us so we can go to heaven. That's, yeah. Newsflash, if you don't know, we're not perfect. So sometimes, yeah, we don't help the process. And we just need to do a better job. And, and sometimes, though, we are doing the best we can, and there's still going to be critics. It's just the way it is. Been there, too. Okay, so that's why we need to be humble like the lamb of God. But let me just encourage anyone in this room who has had a, a, a painful experience from a church or a Christian, Jesus is the center of our faith, not the people of the faith. Amen. Jesus is. We're putting our faith in Christ for salvation, not the church. That's an important teaching today. Jesus is saying, come unto me, not the church. I will save you. I forgive you. And then God will deal with his church. And he, we, we do need to keep growing and polish ourselves up and help ourselves and, and be real about our weaknesses and all those things. God will deal with that. The devil wants you to stay away from God and he'll use the church as that, unfortunately. It's, what a scheme, huh? We're all a work in progress, me included. So, today, if you need to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, tell him, I believe in you as the Son of God. Let's close our eyes and pray if that's you. You may not have come down, that's okay. You didn't have to. God meets you where you are, whether you're online right now or in this room. Do you believe that Jesus is from the Father in heaven? Do you believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God, born into this world to live a perfect life so he could be the perfect sacrifice for all your sin? Do you believe that you need forgiveness of your sin? And will you trust him to be the salvation that you need in your life? If you said yes to all that, you are saved. You are being transformed. Your position is different in God's eyes. You once were lost and now you are saved. Now you're standing in Christ, not outside of Christ. You have been transformed from the inside out and you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. And you need to continue to learn and grow in your faith and let the church disciple you. Let the Holy Spirit disciple you because he's the best disciple maker. And read the word. And there's free Bibles in the pews to take today. All right, if you need a free Bible, there's a little, there's a little string on it as a gift for you to read the word of God. Read the book of Acts. You're gonna learn the gospel even in, in the first few chapters. You're gonna learn about it. Believe in Jesus Christ today. You are forgiven. He loves you. He, he forgives those who repent of their sin and turn from their wicked ways. You will be forgiven and saved right now. And then his Holy Spirit is available even more, not just at salvation, 
but even more of his spirit, the gift of the spirit, which we're gonna learn next week, to fill you with power and help to be witnesses for Christ. Receive his spirit today too, in Jesus' name. I always want more of the Holy Spirit. (laughs) I want the spirit to work in me more and more. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. Thank you, God, for in the midst of hurt, in the midst of our own sin and consequences, you're saying, I love you, come home. Lord, save today. Lord, I pray that you would reignite the church to be set on fire by your spirit. May we know that we are sent people, sent by the Holy Spirit to tell this good news. God, change this church from the inside out. Lord, help us to become more like Jesus. Help us to become more like the church you called us to be, empowered by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. And God, we give you this song right now. We're saying, take my whole life. Church, let's sing this song together, declaring, giving our whole life to him. And those of you who are giving your life to Christ, and if you still need prayer, come on down. We, we ask all these things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.